And so those folks are wrong who would suggest that, well, my mind is able to see clearly and understand rational arguments, but the problem is with my will. I might choose the wrong thing here and there. Or others might say, well, my will is neutral. I can make a choice for good or for evil. And so I am free in that regard. That's not consistent with what Isaiah is saying here. Our whole nature, every aspect of our being is corrupted and polluted by our sin. Their minds are corrupted in that they spin these wicked arguments to, to deceive and corrupt others. Their will is polluted because they run the evil. They can't wait to engage in wicked things. The heart is corrupt, desperately wicked. Isaiah is not being too pessimistic here about our human nature. He's being realistic. He's explaining just really what our situation is. And so he uses very vivid language to describe it. I cannot help with my English background to think of the play Macbeth by uh, Shakespeare and that image of Lady Macbeth who after persuading her husband to kill uh, a relative, cannot deal with the guilt that comes over her. And she goes through the palace at night sleepwalking and she has visions of blood still on her hands and she's right trying to wash her hands for 15 minutes at a time. Oh, the spot, that damn spot, it won't go out. Because the guilt is so much a part of her that it's as though she sees it on her hands. See, this is the corruption of our humanity. How desperate it is. Isaiah goes even further. God looks at our humanity and he sees us in our uh, deplorable condition and God himself is amazed. Look at verses 15 and following. God is astonished that no one stands up to help. No one calls out for justice. No one goes into the courts and cries out for a just cause. They are all corrupt. They are all polluted. God waits in vain for anyone to respond in an appropriate fashion. You see how wrong the Arminian point of view is which says that God is simply a gentleman up in the, the skies above. He waits for us to respond when we feel good and ready for it, when we see the reasonableness of His uh, offer, we will accept it and then pursue that if we wish. That's not going to happen. Isaiah says the Lord looks over all of humanity and He's astonished. No one rises up. No one calls out for help. No one cries for justice. They are corrupted in their sin. And so what Isaiah said is that the only way of escape is not from below going up, but from above coming down. It's from God sovereignly taking the initiative. God unilaterally acting on His own behalf to work salvation for us. To produce that repentance and confession of sin, that abandonment of sin, that we ourselves cannot produce within ourselves. God must act. And so Isaiah uses this vivid imagery of God as we're going into battle. He sees that there's a problem there and nobody's willing to address it, so God determines that He will do it. And He dons His battle gear, His helmet of salvation, His breastplate of righteousness. Not that God lacks righteousness, justice, or salvation. God is perfectly righteous in Himself, fully abundant in righteousness, no defect in God. So how does He clothe Himself with these things to engage in this warfare? It's not that God lacks these things. Rather, I think Isaiah is anticipating His work in Jesus Christ, who would enter into this world and take on our humanity, clothe Himself with our flesh, and then, as the mediator of the covenant, as our Messiah, engage in a life of righteousness, whereby that righteousness is what brings us salvation. God and God alone must act. And He acts through the Lord Jesus Christ to accomplish this great work of salvation. 
You know, in modern theology today, we think about Jesus as the one who expresses love and urges us to show love, and that's what he does. But Isaiah has a very vigorous view of Jesus, taking on this battle view. Um, in our modern Protestant churches today, there's an abandonment of any aspect of warfare imagery in our hymns and our prayers or what have you. We write those things out. Onward Christian soldiers? No, we don't do that anymore. That's militaristic. That's confrontational. We cannot include that in worship. Worship is to be an expression of love, fellowship, and inclusion. And so the Jesus of the modern Protestant pulpit today is a loving sap. <laughs> a loving God who expresses warmth and appreciation for everyone regardless of what they feel, think, or do. I welcome you. That's not the, the Jesus that we have here who, who is the divine warrior who takes on the battle gear and goes into battle against the wickedness of the world in the day. And Isaiah sees it at first in very uh, judgmental terms, in terms of uh, driving out the wicked and bringing God's wrath on those who are his enemies. And when we come into the New Testament, that's exactly what we see in Jesus. We not, might not be attuned to appreciate it, but when Jesus enters into his ministry, he enters into that ministry as the divine warrior, clothed in battle gear, going off to war. You see that in the way that the Gospels portray Jesus. He goes out, first of all, in the wilderness. Where Israel long ago had wandered many years and failed, Jesus does battle with Satan in his temptations and overcomes him through faithfulness. And then following that, he enters back into the land of Canaan, like Joshua long ago, to conquer the land. And he does so in full battle gear, advancing on the kingdom of darkness. And so the demonic hordes that were throughout the realm of that day we're confronted with the Son of God who goes forth to war. And Jesus casts out the demons. They say, we know who you are, the Son of God. As though by naming him they could have some control or power over him. But they realize that they are in conflict and they cry out to them, you're not going to cast us out into the outer darkness? There's one conflict where Jesus meets the, the man who's possessed of the legions of demons. Warfare imagery, and Jesus casts them out and drives them into the abyss. He is engaged in spiritual war. He uses the image to defend his uh, exorcisms by saying that he is the one who binds the strong man and then plunders his house. That is his work. He is a warrior. And he begins by cleansing the heavens and the earth, driving out the forces of wickedness and darkness that were in the world of the day. Much like when he went into the temple and drove out the money changers. He drives Satan from the heavens. When the disciples return from their earthly ministry, mind you, there were 12 disciples first, depicting the 12 tribes who went with Joshua to conquer the land of Canaan. Then there were 72 disciples who went out two by two, much like the 70 elders of Moses, who in some ways respected the, the nations of the earth, the 70, tables of, or 70 nations on the table of nations in Genesis. Jesus is the warrior with his army around him. And he says, with regard to the conflict, I saw Satan falling like lightning from heaven. And of course, the final death blow to Satan and his hordes was accomplished at the cross where Christ laid down his life in apparent loss but actually his moment of great victory when he crushes the head of the serpent for us and wins the deliverance of the people of God. Jesus is that divine warrior of whom Isaiah spoke. He is the one who takes on the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness so that we would be saved from our sin, so that we would be delivered from this realm of total depravity, of corrupt culture and death. Jesus is the one who acts for us. And the comfort of the gospel is because this work is God's work, then we can be assured of our salvation and fear nothing. 
If we are joined to Christ, then God has made a covenant with us. And it's with this that Isaiah closes. He speaks of how God has made a covenant with His people. He's placed His word and, on their lips and His spirit in their hearts. And that word and spirit will not depart from them from one generation to the next. What a wonderful covenant God makes with us. When we are redeemed by the Lord, He gives us His word that opens our eyes to see truth. Whereas in the old world, truth was followed in the streets and nobody understood what truth was. In the kingdom of God, we see truth because we have God's word describing that truth. And it's placed on our lips so that we might confess it before our world today. The power of the Spirit is that which produces this work of God in our hearts. And the way that we know that we are joined to Christ is if Christ's word is on our lips. If we speak the truth to others in our day. His word and spirit is upon us. And so unlike some today who uh, talk very much about the spirit of God guiding them and leading them to this or that decision. Without looking to the scriptures and what God has said. Isaiah brings us both of them. God's word in Christ and the Spirit at work within us. The two being a secure foundation for our lives. And the promise of God is that not only is this to be received individualistically, atomistically, as my personal experience, but is that which transcends me, goes beyond me to my children and my grandchildren and for generations beyond. You see the failure of much of modern American culture where American preaching goes out and talks about very much the individual, what the individual must do. It doesn't see God's generational plan for God's church, for His kingdom. The blessings are of salvation, as Peter said at Pentecost, are for you and for your children. And for all whom the Lord our God will call to Himself. The great hope of the gospel then is that it is a word which addresses us and our families and changes them to the glory of God. What is it with you? Where is your heart this morning? Have you been released from the realm of darkness and death that Isaiah has described? Or are you still caught within its web? There's a study in the National Geographic magazine of a spider called Portia. I won't get the full scientific name. But the Portia spider is fascinating in the sense that what it does is it goes to other spiders' webs. It lands on another spider's web and then imitates an insect that's caught within the web. So that the other spider will respond by thinking it has a meal waiting for it. It'll come out and go after the meal and there is the Portia spider to go attack that spider and kill it and eat it. Amazing. Dreadful. <laughs> but interesting. As Jonathan Edwards would say, admirable. <laughs> As a picture of what takes place in the world around us. If you refuse Jesus and his call to embrace him in the living faith, following after him as his disciple, if you wish to continue on in your world, then, mind you, you live in a very dangerous world. And you may form your intricate webs and think, oh, how wonderful they are. And I've got my food, I've got everything that I need. Watch out. There's a portia out there that will get you. You will die. You will perish. God himself is in no way withheld by your little webs. He will brush them all aside. And it takes the wicked. And like that spider in Edward's son, drops them into the fire. You have to contend not with other insects, but with God himself. Today is the day to repent. In the terms of the Lord. Confessing that it's against you that we have sinned. 
And our only hope is in you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the ministry of your word and the great work of salvation that you've given to us. We pray that you would instruct us and teach us, defend us from false teaching, which would flatter us into thinking that things are not as bad as they really uh, seem. Help us, Lord, to see them as you see them and to take comfort in the promises of your gospel, the promise of your spirit and your word and the rest and the truths that your word provides to us. We ask that your spirit would strengthen us as we leave this place. Grant us your blessing as we continue in worship. We ask it in Jesus' name.